Thank you, Rob, for uh, that introduction. Um, I've actually have been here before, not to the DOP conference, but to uh, Stratford. We came here in a barge, um, and we drove all the way down uh, um, in the canals. It was very interesting. Um, anyway, so thank you very much for um, this invitation. I'm going to talk about um, leadership research and how we can inform uh, practice. And as Rob said, um, I'm very interested to, to step back and, and chronicle um, uh, how um, things, trends have been um, appearing, disappearing, uh, what's happening, how can we know uh, what counts and what doesn't, uh, what constitutes evidence, um, and, and can we use in practice um, some of the things um, that uh, academicians uh, produce. So I'm going to be uh, a little bit uh, uh, critical. I'm, I'm critical even of my own work, so <laughs> the, my first big paper that I published um, uh, in 2002, um, I, I just shot down with another paper I published two years ago. So, so you know, when I turn my, my fire on any theory or uh, 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 trend, uh, I've done it to, my, to myself as well. So, and this is how science should be. We should be skeptical. We should be updating our beliefs. Um, we should be using um, new evidence um, um, in, in a way that, that, that um, uh, reflects what, 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 what we truly know. Um, so um, about 10 years before I was born, uh, Warren Bennis, who's been referred to as the Dean of Leadership Gurus and somebody who did a lot of of practice-oriented work, um, stated of all the hazy and confounding areas in social psychology, leadership theory undoubtedly contends for top nomination. Probably more has been written and less is known about leadership than about any other topic in the behavioral sciences. Today, I regret to say that um, what he says is, is still pretty much valid. We don't really know what's happening. Um, it's, it's a confusing um, um, uh, topic to study. There are many different angles from which we can study it, but there are lots of pitfalls um, that we have to deal with in studying it. Um, so let me quickly just define what leadership is, and this is a shameless plug for uh, uh, our book that we just uh, put out. Um, so we've defined, David Day uh, and I have defined leadership as a formal or informal, contextually rooted and goal-influencing process that occurs between a leader and a follower groups of followers or institutions. So important in this definition is that leadership can be, is often confounded with authority. So the fact that someone occupies a position of leadership doesn't necessarily make, turn them into a leader. So the, the first thing we've got to understand here is that it can be formal or informal. There are a lot of people who exert um, influence who, who are not formal leaders. Secondly, it's contextually rooted. You can't just transpose leadership theories um, across domains and expect them to work in the same way. Uh, third thing is you've got to have some kind of goal to focus on. You know, leadership's not just about, you know, hugging each other, telling each other how great we are and singing kumbaya. Um, it's also about ensuring that the organization adapts to the external environment um, and, and focusing on the nuts and bolts, good old task leadership. And that's something that's completely ignored in mon modern theories of leadership. Um, and the other thing is that uh, leadership in organizations, in other words, interpersonal leadership, and leadership of organizations, in other words, institutions, works completely differently. Um, so what, what we need to do as, as, as scholars is try to put all these pieces together by looking at um, the process of leadership, the traits of leaders, uh, behaviors, inferences, and attributions that people make when they observe leaders. And, and because of all this, because all these things are unique, different pieces in puzzles, it's very, very hard to get a, a good picture of what constitutes leadership without really understanding all these things that are happening here and which can introduce um, some biases. So let me just uh, put out some truths um, about leadership and truths Truths is in um, inverted commas, um, and you'll see why I say that. So um, some of the well-known theories, and I'm using the word here very lightly, um, LMX, transformational leadership, and, and that's where I originally did a lot of my work on, and that's the paper that I've uh, dis disowned uh, recently. Um, and authentic leadership are some of the most important predictors of leadership outcomes. Um, as you will see, I'm going to um, um, uh, give, show you some evidence that this is not necessarily uh, th the case, but it's assumed to be the case. And a lot of these theories actually drive uh, what we do in practice, what we measure in practice, and how we develop leadership uh, uh, training uh, trainings. Um, IQ doesn't matter much for leadership outcomes. So this is something that I find very interesting because um, there's a lot of history behind uh, um, um, uh, intelligence and how it affects uh, performance, both in, in terms of perceptions and in terms of um, objective uh, performance. And, and uh, according to the latest meta-analyses that have been done, IQ 
has a very small effect uh, on, on perceptions and objective outcomes. Um, I'm going to show that this is actually true. Um, with all due respect to our sponsors, um, from what, what, what we do know when we uh, control for personality, intelligence, and other contextual effects, that very little is left, and this is for leadership. So I'm not talking about other domains where, where perhaps emotional intelligence may matter greatly, um, but, but when we specify the models correctly, when we control for the usual suspects, meaning the big five or big six personality traits and intelligence, uh, we don't find much predictive validity in this yet. Um, a lot of this is used um, in selection and in guiding uh, policy and practice. So I'm, I'm not claiming that it doesn't work, perhaps the measures don't work well, or perhaps the theories aren't well specified. And then there's the depressing stuff like the Queen Bee phenomenon, which has um, uh, really received a lot of press uh, lately. Um, so apparently these are, this, this phenomenon goes something like this, you know, women who get power um, uh, want to dominate power, and just like the metaphor of the queen bee, there's only, there's only one queen. There's only one queen, and 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 all the others are killed off. So when women become uh, leaders or powerful leaders, they push away all younger women, and they don't want any women around them. So that's really depressing. You see stuff like, you know, why do women bully each other at work? The bitches, at Shen, as Shannon saw them, came in three varieties. Um, she categorized them as the aggressive bitch, the passive aggressive bitch, and the tuned out indifferent uh, bitch. I mean, <laughs> you see this stuff and you go like, wow, are, are women really like that? I mean, are you women, when you get power, is that what you do? Um, you know, it's quite possible that there are one or two small cases that have been documented of women who do, who, who've done this and, you know, other women who may have agreed with these one or two cases. But, you know, when we study science, we ought to step back and look at trends and causal processes. You know, a little case here and there means nothing. My grandfather lived to be 93. Yet in the morning, he used to take a shot of, of, uh, of uh, grappa. He used to smoke unfiltered cigarettes, 40 of them every day. Now, I cannot claim that you know, drinking grappa in the morning and f smoking 40 unfiltered cigarettes will, will guarantee that you live to be 93. He was an outlier. He lived up in the mountains of Crete. He used to walk maybe 15, 20 kilometers every day. Um, he ate very little meat, lots of olive oil, fruits and nuts and other things. And perhaps he had good genes. And, and I hope I have some of his good genes too. <laughs> um, anyway, the point is, you know, you see stuff like this. Women apparently now prefer male bosses because, you know, they don't like working for queen bees. And, you know, these, these women are tyrannical and, and stuff like this. So this really bothers me when I see things like this. And, and, I, and I think, you know, how is it possible that policy is guided in this way? And why do mindsets um, have these kind of, 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 see these patterns and, and, um, and, and how come these narratives, based on strong metaphor, uh, make it through when, when, when they perhaps may not be true? So one of the biggest problems is, um, and uh, uh, I'm actually editor-in-chief of the Leadership Quarterly. Some of you may have heard of this journal. Um, we publish uh, Leadership Science. And it's, it's a pretty well-ranked journal. I think it's a, a four, a four, uh, ranked four in the ABS list in, in the UK. Um, and uh, I, I recently did a paper just before becoming editor-in-chief to see what's going on in terms of publication trends. And one thing that I thought was pretty alarming is, is that field surveys uh, based on cross-sectional observational designs completely dominate what we do, whereas if we really want to understand the causal processes, we need other kinds of designs. We need field experiments, we need lab experiments, or we need what's called natural um, experiments. So part of the problem is that I think we're using the wrong methods and more and more people are doing more and more um, of, 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 of bad or research that's, that's uninformative. So let me just give you a typical example that you may have seen in, in the journal. Not now, because this is kind of stuff I desk reject straight away. It won't get through uh, and, and go into the review process. But the typical leadership study goes something like this. LMX, which many of you may have heard of, Leader Member Exchange, or Quality of Leader Member Relations. So it's how much you like your leader, how much you trust your leader, um, how much your leader roots for you, uh, things like that. So it's basically measuring affect for the leader is typically used as a regressor or a predictor of why, why meaning performance, and is usually studied using surveys. So we'll go and ask um, subordinates of a leader, you know, how much do you like your leader? Does your leader defend you? Does your leader do this and that? Um, and the, the, the first question is, you know, when we want to understand if X causes Y, we need to 
manipulate X. We need to exogenously manipulate. We need to randomize it. Now, how is it possible to randomize the quality of a relationship? The quality of a relationship is an outcome that depends on many things. And I'll, I'll talk about these in, in, in a bit. So in science, we exogenously manipulate something to ensure that no other cause predicts Y that may be correlated with X. But here we have a problem, because there are variables that cause LMX and Y, which if we don't measure, is going to confound the effect of LMX on Y. For example, the leader's ability and personality will determine whether you have a good relationship. But the leader's ability and personality may also determine the Y variable, the performance of the subordinate. If I don't measure these leader level variables or these follower level variables or organizational variables. Some leaders are selected on certain characteristics or some leaders are given more resources. <laughs> By giving the leader more resources, the leader can maybe motivate the follower with uh, contingent rewards or with bonuses or what have you. So there are variables that predict the quality of relationship and that also predict performance. That, and if they're not measured, um, then um, we, we can't really know if LMX causes anything. But the majority of leadership research that's done on LMX completely ignores this point. Okay? And LMX is not the only problem, though one of the worst offenders, because it's clearly an outcome. All measures of leadership are endogenous. So you know, if you think you're safe because you're measuring transformational leadership, and you're going to be measuring something like um, individualized consideration. So if I'm your leader, I might give you, show you individualized consideration to the extent that you are not lazy, to the extent that you are able, to the extent that you listen to me. So I adjust my leadership style as a function of what the subordinate does. So clearly, again, individualized consideration is not exogenous. It cannot be used to predict anything. So we cannot know, then, if this actually matters for performance. We may be measuring the wrong thing. So the researchers that uh, usually use these methods think they have an ace up their sleeve, and they say, you know what we're going to do? We're going to measure LMX at time one, and we're going to have a longitudinal design, and then we'll measure the performance variable at time two. Therefore, because LMX comes before um, time two performance, therefore LMX must have caused time two performance. Um, and so we regress LMX on performance, we get an estimate, and that's the estimate we use to inform policy. Well, that's a problem, okay? The problem is a fallacy that we've known for many years. It's the post hoc ergo propter hoc fallacy. After this, therefore because of this. So simply because you observe something before something else doesn't mean that that first something caused the second something. Because both the first thing and the second thing could be um, uh, due to an omitted cause. So imagine those, all these omitted causes I mentioned before, these three things, are captured in Z. And imagine that Z predicts both LMX and Y, and we have some coefficient that expresses this. Um, the problem is that we cannot estimate the effect of X on Y if we don't control for all these omitted causes. And if we do split up time periods, well, Z is going to correlate with itself over time, um, so we're going to have something like this. So imagine we have a causal model where we have Z that predicts at time one both Y1 and X1, but we're going to measure X only at time one, and we're going to measure Y at time two, and we're going to estimate beta one and hopefully um, inform policy in this way. Well, the problem is the following. You're making an assumption that Z does not correlate with itself over time. You're making an assumption that Z does not affect X1, and you're making an assumption that Z2 does not affect Y2. So the only time that this makes any sense is if, is if this path or this path or this path are zero. Then we could do this, but it's very unlikely um, to happen. So this is the problem that I call of uh, endogeneity. So one thing that I do as well is I'm, uh, I've, I've developed a lot of podcasts uh, where I try to explain some advanced statistical procedures or, or research in, in, in more intuitive ways. And I have a podcast called Endogeneity and Inconvenient Truth. If anyone's interested, um, I explain this uh, more in depth. Uh, it's on YouTube and freely available um, in, in English. Um, anyway, so let's just go back to uh, what Rob said about the diseases. So reflecting on all these things and reflecting on how uh, the research that we do informs policy, I, I realize that there's a, there's, there's a big problem in, in, in how research is done in our, in our field, but not only. This is, affects most social sciences fields. Um, and the, these five diseases, as Rob uh, referred to them, um, are, are, are things that I think 
um, are predictable and, and uh, depend very much on, on how we do our practice. So just to, to define what I mean by disease, it's a disorder that has some symptoms and causes some debilitating outcomes on a body, and the body in this case is body of knowledge. So why do these exist? They exist because of these reasons. It's about how collectively we do our science. Um, the conditions under which it's done and which incentives are provided, um, particularly because of fetishizing quality over quantity, um, we're going to cut some corners. And we've seen some very high-profile cases of theories uh, getting shot down, um, uh, and, and, uh, which has triggered a lot of crises, especially in psychology. I'm going to give you some examples in a bit. So the five diseases include the following. The first one I call significosis, which is an incessant focus on producing statistically significant results. So what happens here? The fact is that most journals, like my journal, now my journal doesn't do this anymore because we will accept null results, is that they will only publish something if it's statistically significant. So that means that imagine if there is a distribution of, of effect sizes, and imagine um, that only significant results are published, and imagine that these significant results are then used to feed into meta-analyses. Well, the whole meta-analysis is biased and cannot be used because it doesn't reflect truly the original distribution of effect sizes. Only the ones that made it through some magical threshold of p equal uh, zero than uh, less than 0 0.5 makes it through. So you know we. Journals insist that um, results have to be significant, and because of this, we truncate the distribution of effect sizes, and by doing that, we de facto bias um, and, and completely um, uh, um, misconstrue what the effect size is. Um, second problem is neophilia. Journals want to have new research published, so they uh, have an excessive appreciation for novelty and snazzy results. But what if these snazzy and novel results are spectacularly wrong? Take the power posing um, stuff. You know, this was all very nice. You know, I can stand like this for two minutes, and that's going to drive my testosterone up. It's going to make me more risk tolerant and more charismatic to an audience. Well, those results have been replicated with three, four, five times more the sample size, blinding researchers and blinding subjects subjects and have been shown to be completely wrong. The original studies were done on a, on a couple of dozen of subjects, by the way, um, with some funky procedures to make uh, the result uh, work. But it was snazzy. It was very uh, uh, interesting. The press loved it. Um, uh, Cuddy's work uh, has been highly cited, and um, uh, one of the highest um, viewed TED Talk of all times was based on a talk and a best-selling book that's been translated in in uh, quite a few dozen languages. Uh, another problem we have is theoria. So just like other kinds of rias, our, <laughs> our, uh, our discipline loves theory. And, and, and they think that, um, you know, Academy of Management Journal, for example, if you don't make a theoretical contribution, there's no way you can publish in there. Um, and, you know, theory, we have theory envy in our field, but we don't really know what theory is, and we don't do it properly. So that's another thing that's causing a lot of problems, is that because you have to make a theoretical contribution, what people typically do is they measure a bunch of things, they look at uh, what's significant, and then write a theory around what's significant. They put the cart before the horse, and of course, this theory will never produce in other contexts. Um, Arigorium is a deficiency of rigor in theoretical and empirical work. I'm going to give some examples of that. But because we're forced to cut corners, because journals want theoretical contributions, because journals want snazzy results, because journals uh, uh, want significant results, well, that's what happens, is we cut corners, and uh, what's published is never going to reproduce or inform policy. And at the end of the day, particularly because we fetishize quantity, we have disjunctivitis, a collection of of, of, of large quantities of redundant trivial works that really don't help us one iota. Um, it's very easy to see these diseases and their consequences. So p-hacking, people are going to gather a whole bunch of variables, and they're going to look to see which is significant. They're going to throw away an outlier or two, insert a control, take it out, retry it again, throw another outlier until one of my key coefficients becomes statistically significant. They're going to engage in questionable research practices. They're going to massage the data, do funky stuff so that it mm, turns out significant. They're going to hark. They're going to hypothesize after the results are unknown. So first they see the results, then they go back and write a theory. Um, we have suppression of replication studies. Try submitting a replication study to Journal of Applied Psychology or to Academy of Management Journal. Impossible to get into because there's nothing new in that. There's no new 
Uh, there's no theoretical contribution. So we have suppression of replication studies. We have suppression of null results. And then basic research that's inductive, that explains a process, is not well regarded. So we have a big problem here. And this engenders crises, a lack of quality in research, and distrust in research, specifically after we see these high-profile cases, you know, Baumeister's work getting shot down, Cuddy's work getting shot down. Um, and, and, and this creates a skepticism in science, and uh, at the end of the day, we don't know uh, what drives what and whether this can inform practice. So let me just give you some examples from my field about this diseased research. Theory is weak and rather tautological. You know, I, I do a lot of work on charisma now and, and also on instrumental leadership. It's task-oriented leadership. And, you know, typically with charisma, we have stuff like, you know, charismatic leaders are inspirational. Uh, no kidding, Sherlock. I mean, you know, it's like the explanandum redefines the explanands. It's, it's, it's very hard to find um, theories where the nature of the phenomenon is identified without resorting to a dependent variable, in other words, defined by its outcome or by its antecedent. So we have a lot of endogenous theorizing. Um, we have a lot of measured leadership styles that are endogenous without specifying how this, uh, how this phenomenon unfolds. Um, and then we have empirical models where we have endogenous variables, like I showed you before, uh, LMX, uh, regressed on other endogenous variables. That doesn't help us a li one little bit. And, and we have lack of causally identified models. So in specifically, um, mediation. So uh, a lot of you have, have read research and, um, uh, on, on how apparently the effect of X uh, goes uh, to Y through M. And, and most of the research that's done that's using mediation in our field is not done correctly. Um, and it's very easy to show this mathematically. We're working on a paper right now where we show the, the problems. Let me just give you a basic example. Suppose the true model that generated the data is here. So we have X. Imagine we manipulate X. We, we put you in a charismatic training condition or in a control group. So we have a large sample of people, and they go either in one group or the other. And then we measure M. So M could be the perceptions that people have of, of the leader. And then later on, we measure Y. And Y could be how much you perform for the leader, how motivated you are. Now, by randomizing, we ensure that X is going to be independent of any omitted causes. In this case, it's U, in E, and Q. And imagine Q is something that I know your good looks. So if anyone has good looks, they're going to be attributed more charisma than someone that has less good looks. But we don't care about this because we've manipulated X, so X is going to be independent of good looks. We're going to have an equal amount of good-looking people in the charismatic training group and in the non-charismatic group. But good looks is going to affect how they, you are seen and may affect, too, how uh, performing the people are for you. If you look better, they might perform better for you, independent of being charismatic, OK? So now, when we do an experiment, we don't care about Q because we've manipulated X. The effect of X on M is fine. If we regress Y on X, that's fine. But if we try to do a mediation model, we're going to have a problem if we don't use the correct estimator. And this is a huge problem, and people who uh, who, who read the literature and, and understand the mathematics behind it realize that most of the results that um, have used mediation studies in our field are not very correct. So for example, you need to use what's called an instrumental variable estimator. So those of you who may use or read about structural equation modeling, what you need to do is you need to model y as a function of m, m as a function of x, and then you need to correlate these two disturbances so that you get the correct coefficient here, which should be about 0.50, OK? This is the, the, the correct coefficient there. We have 2, 0.50. So the indirect effect, when you multiply these two things, the indirect effect should be 1. So if we use an instrumental variable estimator, we get the effect approximately 103. The sample size is only 1,000. Eh? So if we did this simulation a million zillion times, this would converge to, to 1. Now, the typical mediation model that's used in our field, the full mediation model, look what happens when we estimate it. Instead of getting 0.5 here, we get 0.3. And now the indirect effect, instead of being um, 1, is 0.6. We may use what's called the partial mediation model, the Barron and Kenny method or the Preach and Hayes method. And in fact, here now we get minus 0.19, and we get a negative coefficient on the indirect effect. Um, and, you know, you can bootstrap all you want. And this is what the SPSS command does. It bootstraps the standard error of, of this uh, effect here. It's not going to change the fact that the estimate is wrong, okay? So any time one has a mediation model 
and, and if X is truly exogenous, one cannot use the usual methods for mediation, but that's something, that's the go-to solution that most people use when they test mediation, okay? The problems go on and on. Some reviews on empirical work that I've done. So I, I do a lot of bibliometric work and, and, and measuring the impact of science and how, how well it's done. We took a random sample of articles from top journals in the field. Journal of Applied Psychology, Academy of Management Journal, Journal of Management, Leadership Courtly, Personnel Psychology, and OBHTP. And then what we did is we coded them um, for uh, threats to internal validity. In other words, the causal claims that they made, were they valid or not? And we found there was a huge problem that researchers failed to address up to 90% of design conditions that make causal claims invalid. In a more recent review, we found about 80% of articles, and this is in the leadership quarterly, 80% of the articles had one or more endogeneity threats, meaning that we couldn't trust the estimates. And it costs to have endogeneity. What we did also see is that articles that are endog endogeneity prone are less cited. At least the market that uses this work discounts um, uh, results that, that are not causally specified. In the latest review that we've done, we found that out of 189 articles that tested a process model, so this mediation model that I showed you, only 26% of these articles used an exogenous predictor. So, in other words, that it was manipulated or varies uh, randomly in nature, and only 2% use an instrumental variable uh, estimator. So the, the rest uh, did it completely wrong. And this, this was, again, just published in Journal of, of Management. So the problems go on and on. Let me just give you a couple of examples um, in studying power. So um, if I'm going to study power, I need to randomize power. So I need to give a population of people power or less power or no power, and then see what happens. If I observe people who have power versus people who don't have power, I have to model the process which got them to the point where they have power or not. So I have to model the selection process. But this is a big problem. So it's quite possible that those people who seek power are very different from the people who don't seek power. If you don't understand the process which gets them there, you cannot compare people who have power to those who don't have power. And this is what we typically see in the field. Um, yet. People try to get around um, from this problem by, by using experimental designs. And the best known design is by Galinsky, um, which is called the priming paradigm. And, and this priming paradigm, I'll show you what it does. But typically, what happens is that this creates a demand effect. And the demand effect cannot help us to understand the problem. I'll show you this in a minute. Same with charisma. We have omitted variables. Um, if I ask people to rate uh, a leader for charisma, um, they may rate the leader as charismatic um, because the person is more attractive, more symmetrical. So as Rob said, um, uh, one of the things that I study is how people get elected. Um, and I can tell you there's a huge effect for symmetry, attractiveness, and looks that drives whether they get elected or not. And this also affects how they get rated on other um, uh, dimensions of leadership. If you know that the leader has had good performance, independent of how they act, you will rate them higher or lower in a way that makes sense. So it's very hard to figure out whether charisma drives anything unless you measure all these omitted causes. But when, when experiments are done, we have another big problem. We randomize people to, to charisma training or not. And oftentimes, instead of having a placebo control group or an alternative treatment, people are randomized to charismatic treatment or to no treatment. So you know, if you're in a study and you know you're being studied, you might perform differently than if you didn't know you were studied. Um, and that's another huge, huge problem we have. Let me give you an example on, on power so you'll see um, why, why we have a bit of an issue here. So typical instructions given to participants in the experimental treatment is something like, please recall a particular incident in which you had power over another individual or group of individuals. Please describe the situation in which you had power, what happened, and how you felt. Okay, now think about this. Imagine you're in the experimental group and you're told to do this. And in the control group, you're told to write a story about what you did yesterday. Now, the manipulation check is to have coders read the stories and count how many power themes are present in the essays. Now, is this a manipulation check? A manipulation check is really to see whether the person experiences um, uh, what uh, they've been exposed to. In other words, if I inject you with an antibiotic, I should take a sample out and I should be able to observe the antibiotic molecules in your blood. But this is simply following the orders that the experimenters have given to the subjects. These people also know what the experiment's about. 
these subjects have no idea what the experiment's about. And this creates what's called an asymmetric demand effect that's correlated with the treatment. So in this case, we cannot know if power is doing anything. And then to add insult to injury, subjects do an inconsequential task. And this inconsequential task may be, you know, hypothetically, if you're interviewing someone and they did ABC, what would you do in that situation? It's very hard to know because we're not really observing in, in reality what people are doing. There are no trade-offs, um, there are no incentives, and it's very, very hard to, to figure out whether power does anything of the sort that some uh, people claim that it does. So in the study that Rob mentioned about uh, leader corruption depends on power and testosterone, what, what we did do is we did randomize people to have power, or a lower amount of power. So, so the control group was, was not no power because in, in that case then we would have an unfair comparison. We gave degrees of power to people and we gave trade off to the leaders that they could profit for example from taking from a public resource uh, versus creating more wealth for their followers. You also measured people's testosterone which is exogenous, it depends on your genes. And lo and behold we found that the more testosterone subject have, especially men which have about three times more of the stuff than women do, um, the more they were prone to be corrupt. So that was an interesting, funky result. Uh, <laughs> um, so, you know, it's very hard to know whether power corrupts. Um, we looked at it uh, with uh, one of my students, uh, Samuel Benderhan, and uh, we defined it in terms of uh, corruption being a moral deterioration resulting from an abuse of power for personal gain. Um, and, you know, if you're interested to know more about that study, um, you know, please uh, take a look. It was published in uh, 2015. Um, very quickly, intelligence, uh, we think it doesn't really matter for uh, leadership. Um, and we, we, we wrote a paper in Journal of Applied Psychology um, that was just published a few months ago, where we identified many, many serious problems in, in studies that apparently identified whether intelligence matters for leadership. But, Many of the studies use the wrong functional form. They assume that the relationship is linear, and it actually may be nonlinear. I'll show you in a minute why. Um, very often, measurement error is, is, is not regarded. Um, there are a lot of individual differences that are omitted. For example, if you want to study the effect of, of individual differences on performance, you need to measure the whole gamut of individual differences that may matter for performance, including personality. Um, if you're going to take a sample of leaders from a particular setting, well, you need to have variation in the setting. So, for example, there could be cultural level differences, there could be organizational level differences, and there also could be time differences. Time shocks can affect how leaders behave in times of crisis, or if there's economic insecurity, um, or whatever. If we have uh, um, full employment, you know, leaders are going to act a little bit different. So we need to measure processes over time and take into account different effects at different levels of analysis. Now, if you look at the scatter plot on the left, I've put this uh, curved line in here, but if you just looked at this, you wouldn't think at all that this relation is curvy linear, okay? Um, that's the first thing. If we just looked at the, the linear relationship between the, the relationship between Wunderlich and, and some dimension of leadership, the correlation is 0 0.15, which is pretty close to the correlation that's been estimated in uh, meta-analyses about 0.2 for the effect of intelligence on, on leadership. Um, now, when we adjust these things for measurement error, uh, for omitted variables, look what happens. Okay? They, they fall pretty closely around, uh, around uh, uh, the line, and then depending on which leadership style we measure, we may have an R squared of about between 70 to 80%. Um, and the idea was, there was an article written by Simonton in Psychological Review about 30 years ago, where he proposed that the relationship between intelligence and, and leadership perceptions would be not linear, but curvy linear. And he had a very specific reason why. He said, look, a leader should be about 1.2 standard deviations higher than the average of the followers to be effective. Why? Well, they need to be smarter. They need to be able to provide solutions to problems. Um, they need to be able to keep peers at bay. But if they're too smart, Sheldon type, you know, Big Bang Theory, where no one understands what they say, um, then the relationship will start to go down because they won't understand what the person is saying, um, they won't be able to relate to what they're saying, and they won't be able to identify with the target leader per se. Um, so what happened is we, we gathered data to test this across different countries, and we had several hundred leaders, and uh, lo and behold, we found exactly what uh, Simonton had predicted. Um, and, you know, like I said before, if we did a straight line through this, we would get a correlation of 0.15, which is very, very low. But 
the correlation changes all the time. If you take the tangent, um, uh, the first derivative um, at, 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 at a particular point, you see that here the correlation is 0.63. Here the correlation is 0.25. Here it's completely flat where Symington had predicted. And here it starts to become negative. So, you know, if we specify the wrong functional form, then of course we're going to get results which don't look very good. So, you know, we hope that this article, sorry, I put the wrong date, it's 2017 uh, JAP. Um, uh, we hope that this is going to change mindsets in terms of how we do model these things. Um, or how about the effect of transformational leadership on outcomes? So transformational leadership is probably one of the most studied theory of leadership. That's where I did my work originally on. Um, uh, Bruce Avoglio was one of the advisors on my thesis committee. But as I said, um, I've, I've, you know, after studying leadership for 20 years or so, I started to realize there's, there are problems here. You know, leaders don't just motivate. They've got to do other stuff. They've got to, they've got to scan the internal and external environment. Um, they've got to develop a strategy. They've got to develop milestones that have to be met. They have to monitor outcomes. Um, they have to provide task level expertise. And this expertise has to be um, really unique to that environment. So they need to know the nuts and bolts of what's going on. Apart from that, we have measurement error. We have omitted variables, other leadership styles, like I just said, task-oriented leadership. Um, ignoring endogeneity issues of the sort that I mentioned before. And again, ignoring these things. There are huge differences between organizations, between cultures, and as a function of time effects. So what we did is we, we, we did a large cross-sample study over, uh, uh, across many countries um, across seven years to see what would the typical research design tell us about the effect of transformational leadership on, in this case, effectiveness. Okay? And if we did it the typical way, if we ignored task-oriented leadership, what we call instrumental leadership, you see the partial standardized beta is 0.63. So that's a huge effect. And it's very close to the meta-analysis done by Judge and Piccolo and others, which show that transformation leadership, whether you control for contingent rewards and management by exception and all those other leadership styles, it has a very strong effect. Okay, so that's very nice. We kind of replicate what the, what the rest of the, of, of the research shows. But then when we start to include task-oriented leadership, and then when we take into account the endogeneity concerns, so let's just go all the way to the right, you see that the effect of transformation leadership is overstated by a factor of 300%, approximately. Okay? It's three times higher when you don't control for the endogeneity effects, and if you don't control for the omitted effects, in this case, task-oriented leadership. So, you know, this is used a lot in training and performance, and that's very nice. I'm not saying that transformation leadership is not important, but that's one little small part of the leadership puzzle. Leaders do many other things than just motivate others and stimulate them and sing kumbaya. OK, so is there hope? Um, so this is the article um, that, that Rob was talking about, where I talked about the five diseases. And um, the, the, the article is titled, On Doing Better Science from Thrill of Discovery to Policy Implications. And, and in this article, I lay out all these problems and how we can actually move along and, and produce evidence-based research that can inform practice. So, at my journal, and, and, and I hope there's, uh, there are people here who, who uh, will consider sending uh, their best work to us, we, we are now publishing fewer papers, but much more consequential papers. For example, we publish replication null results. We expect stronger theorizing and culling of theories. We're not scared to publish an article that says, you know, this theory is wrong for this and this reason. And here's the data that shows why um, I believe that to be the case. We're looking for more experiments, and we're looking for more advanced designs that can make causal claims. These are what I call the natural experiments. It's stuff that's borrowed from medical sciences and econometrics, um, short communications, and the last thing is inductive research. I really care about inductive research from an Aristotelian perspective. We've got to observe and build theories instead of building theories and then looking for evidence that will be concordant with a the theory. What that does, it blinds us to what really goes on and it creates what in psychology we know is a, the, 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 the well-known problem of confirmation bias. Anyway, um, I've got about five minutes, but I thought I might stop a bit sooner to give us a bit more time for questions. So um, to conclude, and going back to what I said originally, because this was really depressing when I started reading about the queen bee phenomenon, it does exist but only where it's supposed to exist, in beehives. So there's a paper that's coming out in Leadership Quarterly that I've conditionally accepted. And in fact, the evidence overwhelmingly shows, and in a very well done, clever um, um, study where they use a natural experiment from the results of elections, 
um, and, and what they look at is the, the elections where it was kind of very, very close. The margin of, of, of victory was, was less than 0.2%. So the, the winner is like randomized. So this is what a regression discontinuity design does. And this is looking at elections across many municipalities uh, in, in a particular, I don't want to disclose the country yet until I accept the article, but it's going to get accepted for sure. And what they do show is that when women become mayors, they sh the first thing that happens is um, after some time they hire more women and they close the pay gap between men and women. This is now with thousands of samples and thousands of replications over long periods of time. So you know this thing about the queen bee doesn't exist. So that made me very happy to to see uh, a paper that really is going to shoot down one of the big uh, myths that we have. You know that women are evil and vile, and when they get power, they just push away all other women. That's not true. Anyway, that's all I have to say. Thank you. <laughs>